2008, again, I quote, for the discovery and development of the green fluorescent protein, GFP. And with that, I give you the floor, Professor Shimomura. Uh, thank you, Chair. On August 9, uh, 1945, uh, 70 years ago from now, I had to work as a student for military services uh, during wartime. And in the mountain area, in the suburb of Isahaya City, I was working in the shark-like factory uh, for uh, Japanese uh, uh, Navy uh, aircraft factory. Uh, in March that uh, year, I was already graduated from uh, the uh, junior high school in all educational system, but I had to work continuously. Even after I graduated at that time, I was in charge of the crown case adjustment uh, at the engine repair and maintenance factory of zero fighters in the plant. But due to the uh, uh, destruction of airplane by suicide airport, uh, after April, there are no agents uh, we had to repair. 11 p.m., uh, there was the um, air raid alarming uh, going off. So as usually, uh, together with my friends, I went to the highland near the uh, factory and look up into the sky. And one B-29 from the northern sky was directing for Nagasaki in the south. It was a different uh, flight route, so we were just doing why. And in 20, 12 kilometers off Nagasaki, uh, they draw uh, two to three parachutes. Uh, well, uh, and also there were gunshots. Uh, sporadically targeting those sh uh, parachutes, but there were not human beings hanging from the parachutes. And in two to three minutes, another B-29 aircraft appear, uh, uh, tracing the same route and heading for the um, sky of Nagasaki. At the at the time, the air raid warning stopped, so we went back to the factory. A minute, I sat down on the working chair. I was uh, uh, experiencing the strong flashlight, and strong flashlight came into the small window of the factory, and I was blinded. I couldn't see anything. And 40 seconds after the flashlight, there was a roaming sound. It was not sound per se, but rather reflections of rapid changes of the air pressure. I was complete deaf. I couldn't see anything. On my way back home that night, as rain started to rain, and my wet white shirt turning into gray color. There was black rain. The scenes really gave me disastrous, cruel, shocking experience to me. The scene I saw for two months after that incident that completely changed my beautiful life. In the playground of junior high school where a bomb uh, survivors uh, were evacuated, I saw a half-naked man walking slowly in procession, and also uh, their back and arms covered with the black-colored a sunny as pus, and also warm scrawling around their skins, and also the work to wrap the dead body in the straw bag and pile them up on the carriage, and the eyes of the A-bomb survivors are watching those upper, uh, uh, actions, and uh, that seems really stuck in my brain and mind. My, one of my close friends uh, who were A-bomb in the factory in Nagasaki, he came to our phone one day on his way back to his hometown. What I saw in his face was heavy carotid covering all of his face. I couldn't tell who he, 
who he was at the time when I watched him. And uh, all A-bomb uh, survivors, A-bomb people who directly uh, exposed Dai one after another. But uh, he looked fine. In front of him, who will be dying shortly, I tried to behave joyfully and pleasantly, but I couldn't. It was a very hard night for me. I try not to recall the memories of Ababi, but uh, it's still that scenes sat very firmly, solidly at the bottom of the heart. Never could be eliminated. In 1995, at the uh, 50th anniversary of the bombing, local newspaper Cape Cod Times actually asked me to write an article on the memories of e-bombing, and um, ironically, uh, that article appeared on the newspaper uh, in adjacent to the, pa uh, the, pa uh, the article written by the captain of B-29 fighters who dropped, which dropped a bombing. The captain of the aircraft actually lived in Cape Cod at the time. Two, uh, three years ago in February, the uh, director of Los Alamos National Lab, Dr. John Pearson, sent me an email because my son uh, was working uh, in the laboratory and he was uh, one of the close friends of my son. He requested me to give lecture. And uh, Los Alamos in the state of New Mexico is uh, the place where the clandestine um, Manhattan project went on, and uh, that Manhattan project brought Hiroshima and Nagasaki into ruins. And that was a place those eight bombings were manufactured. And out of curiosity, I, had, I thought I should visit there. But it was fully uh, 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 busy uh, with a lot of uh, uh, the tour trip uh, schedule. So I just responded, uh, if there's an opportunity again, I will go to your place. However, in November, Dr. Charles McMillan, director of the lab, sent me a very cordial invitation to lecture. I could neither postpone or decline, so I promised to give lecture uh, April the 18th, 2013. April 17th in the morning, uh, two days after the bombing incident at the Boston Marathon, I left it. I left Logan Airport in Boston uh, to Dallas Airport to Texas under the very strict security. And uh, I visited Dallas Airport for the first time, but th there's no problem uh, to, uh, to reach the gate uh, for the flight heading for Santa Fe. But uh, there's no uh, announcement for departure, even after the scheduled departure time. And I asked uh, the uh, ground uh, uh, counter people what happened. And they said uh, aircraft hasn't arrived, and we, could, we couldn't find the uh, crew uh, of the flight. Uh, it was a very small aircraft of 60, Peter, uh, 60 people capacity, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, news, uh, the crew, uh, team of crew members appear, and uh, we arrive in Santa Fe, uh, one and a half hour delay. And uh, it looks like uh, this delay in Air Force happened from time to time, and the other passenger didn't care. It seems like the place is an easygoing place. And Santa Fe is the capital of the New Mexico, uh, well-known uh, sightseeing star. But for that, I was surprised because the airport was very small. When I got off from the airplane, it took me only several steps to reach the arrival lobby, and Dr. Pearson and my son are flying from Oregon were waiting for me. Uh, the snow, uh, there was a snow, it was snowing, and uh, using my son's car, we head for, headed for Los Alamos. It was dark. Uh, uh, the trees uh, along the roadside were beautiful with silver thaw. It's a sunny road, and uh, uh, on the right there is a Rio Grande cliff and ravine in the distance. It's not as big as Grand Canyon, but it's similar. And Los Alamos uh, actually was selected by 70 years ago uh, when first director Dr. Robert Oppenheimer came to place uh, that this, to find this place to be a very good place for keep uh, confidentiality. A very Place. We arrived in Los Alamos in 14 minutes, and I went to Hilltop Hotel because I made reservation, but there's something strange happening. When I uh, 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 knock on the door, people uh, show up and 
is that this one that was closed on April the 1st. And I just wonder uh, what happened, but the doctor appears to find another hotel. But uh, uh, on the morning of April 18, the scene of the Los Amores is strange. Uh, at the height of 2,200 meters, uh, the uh, mountains around the town was completely brown. And in the distance, we see the silver white snowdrop mountains. The mountains sort of was not green due to uh, the uh, fires uh, happening in 2011. And uh, at the time, uh, people were evacuated forcibly for two weeks. In the A bombing in Nagasaki, most of the mountains were brown, but uh, green recovered the following year. But the Los Angeles is the, at the high altitude and cold and dry, so that's why the green uh, did not recover so fast. And I went to my office and left uh, before 11 or 5. They must have investigated my background for more than three months, and I have to show the passport and visa and the quick picture, and then finally I got the passage. And uh, I was waiting, a lot of people are waiting for a badge uh, or passage acquisition, but they don't look like scientists. Camera, cell phone, every electric device are prohibited. And the New York Times correspondent, uh, Mr. John Markov, who came uh, from San Francisco to hear my lecture, were accompanied by the laboratory staff and always under surveillance. I just wonder, Nagasaki and Hiroshima are the only fragmented past history? And so, uh, Dr. McBranch uh, showed me the Los Alamos National Research Institute, and uh, Mr. Oppenheimer chose this place by purchasing the summer school, which used to be there. And in the origin, in the beginning, there were 200 people or so. They were all living in barrack-like uh, places. There was laundry outside, and then he was able to get the best brains and lived there. And they were placed in this such inconvenient and secluded place. But in a matter of two years, they produced this atomic bomb. It's really quite amazing. For communicating with the outside world, people used the post box office in Santa Fe post office. If you transport by boat from Los Alamos, it took about two hours, just one way. In New Jersey, Princeton, where there was the university and the high research institute, when physicists wanted to buy tickets to New Mexico, in order to keep secret, they bought this ticket not in, at Princeton, but in a nearby uh, station. So they were instructed, and they sent all the luggage, however, from Princeton station. And so the station workers often wondered why this was the case. And there was a very famous physicist, Richard Feynman. He, he had a wife who was suffering from tuberculosis. And uh, it took several hours to go to Albuquerque, uh, where she was at the sanatorium. Every week uh, from Los Alamos, he went there to see his wife. And then the road uh, on his way there, his car often had tire, had a puncture, and he had a lot of trouble. At Los Alamos, there were some uh, 10,000 people now today, they are doing some weapons research as well, but most of them, the people were involved in biological science, chemistry, and uh, pharmaceuticals, and some science, theoretical science as well, and to do that, they were using the GFP, which I discovered. And I uh, had lunch with the, the scientists uh, who were working in programs other than weapons. And so I questioned, all this research you are doing, it's a peaceful basic science research. Why do you need a high security place like this? Because for scientific progress, you often need to be in some playful mood and mischievous mood as well. The high security environment would be rather affecting negatively. 
Well, the scientists said, no, we don't need this kind of high security. Then why don't you separate this basic science department from the weaponry department? There was no answer, so to speak. But it seems that in the weapons division, they had abundant of fund, and these basic science people were indirectly being supported by that fund. There was another weaponry research institute, which was in California, Lawrence Livermore National Institute. And I had, uh, I gave a speech starting at one o'clock, and my title of the speech was uh, the discovery of GFP was not anticipated. And so my speech was more or less the same as the Nobel Prize speech. And uh, I said there were uh, some dividing roads in my process to discovery seven times. And if I had not taken that road, one, uh, then I would never have discovered uh, the green fluorescent protein. So it was really a miracle that I was able to discover that uh, GFP, one of the Rose that I verged into wood was in 1965. I left my job, a stable job at the University of Nagoya, uh, and knowing fully well that uh, getting the research fund was difficult in the United States, I nevertheless went to the United States in order to explain the mechanisms for luminous uh, protein, equarians, uh, mechanism of uh, illumination, and while I was doing that work, the purifying equarian, I had some small amount of GFP, but rather than throwing it away as impurities, I had kept it. This was another road. Now, I became a bioluminescence expert partly because I chose the pathway in chemistry, and that had to do with the fact that the atomic bomb was dropped over Nagasaki. After the war, there was no school to accept me, and for two and a half years, I was not able to belong to any school. But then, upon finding out that the Department of Pharmacy belonging to the Nagasaki Medical University was going to be established in a place near where I was living, I had, uh, was able to enter that school. And I was not very much interested in pharmaceutics at that time. But the essence of pharmaceutics is chemistry, and so that made me uh, choose the pathway for chemistry. After my uh, speech, I met with Geoff Waldo, the Dr. Geoff Waldo, uh, who was on a wheelchair and who was specializing in biological science. And he was uh, doing some research about fragmented or fission GFP, and he had many patents concerning its application. As for the application and use of GFP, uh, he said, uh, since he started the research, uh, there was so much interest being drawn to that. Next, uh, Dr. Pearson and other scientists of theoretical science were the people I met. And together with them, we went to one of the best restaurants, Dixie Girl, in town. But uh, it was so noisy that I couldn't hear what people were saying. And next day, uh, for two hours, starting at 10 o'clock in the morning, I gave my speech to young scientists and postgraduates and postdoctors. I remember that there weren't very many sharp or pointed questions. And uh, for example, people ask such questions as, what did you do with these luminous organs? Once you cut off the luminous organs, what did you do with the, the jellyfish? What happens to the jellyfish? Or how I felt when I received this news from that I won the Nobel Prize. Uh, from Stockholm, these kind of questions. Nobody asked me any questions about the atomic bomb. For young people, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the bombing probably was simply one spot in long history they were not concerned very much about. 
that completed my official program. And then next I had a, a tour of the Bradbury Science Museum. In 1963, it was Alamos National Institute, the second uh, uh, generation director, Bradbury, Dr. Bradbury, he established uh, this special museum dedicated to uh, the, the atomic bombs. The, drop, the bomb that was dropped in Nagasaki was Fat Man, and the one that was dropped in Hiroshima was Little Boy. The fat man was much bigger than little boy, and uh, there was a life-size model of those bombs being displayed. Uh, on that day, on the 9th of August, 1945, I saw that B-29 come and drop the parachute. That parachute contained a device which will measure and send the information concerning the explosion. And then I went uh, again uh, inside uh, the building after that, and just as I sat on my work table, I was attacked by fierce flash. Now, if I had been outside there and looking up at the sky, I probably would be blind today. There was the parachute used 70 years ago was also in that display. And uh, I felt very scared looking at it. Uh, three days after the bomb was dropped in Hiroshima, uh, the Truman, President Truman dropped the bomb in Nagasaki. When I saw the picture of President Truman, I said to Dr. Pearson, who was taking me there, that I hated him so much. Well, perhaps uh, in a matter of three days, the true President Truman was not very aware of the real effect of that bomb. Uh, the Los Alamos uh, scientists, all of them were against using atomic bomb, he said. But then the President Truman was afraid that Russia would participate in the war and would occupy Japan. And so in order to speed up Japan's surrender, he used a second bomb. The uranium used the little boy, the detonation equipment is relatively simple, and so they did not need any pre-testing. But the plutonium fat man, uh, they needed to be tested, so, so they did it on the 16th of July, 1945, at the Trinity site. And people were so shocked by that fierce one. And the people who were gathered there all said to themselves, damn it, we are real, real damnable people. They were so angry. If Japan had surrendered two weeks before, not so many lives would have been lost. And this is a great regret to me, even today. Thank you very much, Professor Shimomura. This is a very moving story. I think we have a little bit more time than I anticipated, so allow me to interject a, a personal uh, remark. I already told Professor Shimomura in advance. I read his biography yesterday, and I saw that he happened to be in Princeton at the same time as I was in Princeton in um, August 1962. I was then 27, he was then 34. We did not meet. I was a theoretical physicist, he was in the biology department and in different places. But at that time, I was there with my wife and my parents, as it happened, and we decided to go to Washington on a touristic trip to see the museums on a weekend and we happened to be there on the crucial weekend of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we saw the speech by President Kennedy on television and, and, and so on and so forth. And I'm mentioning this because this is the reason why I'm here now, because it was as a consequence of the shock to that, uh, of that event that I then decided to take an interest in uh, the danger of nuclear weapons, and then consequently I was involved in Pagwash and, and so on. Now, let me introduce you, <coughs> Professor 
Toshihide Maskawa. He was born in February 1940 in Nagoya. So he is the younger of the three of us. <laughs> As it happens, he was born just five years and one day before me. <laughs> in the same year, 2008, when Professor Shimomura was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to three Japanese physicists to uh, Yoshiro Nambu, and I quote, for the discovery of the mechanism of spontaneous broken symmetry in subatomic physics, and then jointly to Makoto Kobayashi and Toshihide Maskawa, I quote, for the discovery of the origin of the broken symmetry which predicts the existence of at least three families of quarks in nature, unquote. And now I give the floor to Professor Maskawa. I don't think he will talk about this topic <laughs> because this will be a bit difficult for most of you, but uh, he will, I think, comment on the uh, introductory speech by Professor Shimomura. Please, you have the floor. Uh, Right, and Professor Shimomura's talk was, right, I have heard his story in Stockholm, and uh, jellyfish, actually, and he was saying that uh, he was collecting jellyfish and with all his family members. That was really impressive for me. And his uh, researchers were actually, so I just, uh, I thought that he is really lucky um, in terms of the fact that uh, the family members can contribute to the researches of his. You know, in our field, in my field, probably, uh, even if I ask them to help me, probably there aren't any places for, for, for them to uh, provide support to me. So in that regard, Ours an elementary particle physics. I think it is really the um, is in the very solitary uh, environment, uh, not understood uh, by many people. So it is really the uh, small area of research. Is in other words, um, there are only limited number of people who understand the elementary particle physics. Now, um, Dr. So, um, Dr. Shimomura's work, I just felt envious uh, about and how he has been able to get support from his family members. Backwash to scientists. Uh, as you, most of you know, at the beginning, the Pagwash movement was essentially involving scientists, indeed mostly physicists, and this was because the focus was on nuclear weapons. Through time, it has involved more and more non-scientists because the issues related to the danger of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction and other problems involved also people who were not uh, scientists, uh, politicians, uh, diplomats, and um, uh, decision makers, uh, or former decision makers. And the main goal of Pagwash was actually to influence policy, and therefore it was important to involve uh, such people. And indeed, Pagwash did influence, to a considerable extent, the policy, to contributed to armed control agreements uh, and uh, perhaps, in my opinion, contributed to the great change that occurred in the Soviet Union because it uh, sort of infiltrated the intellectual community in the Soviet Union and was inf important in bringing about what I would call the garbage of uh, re the revolution. But the involvement of uh, scientists from the very beginning had also another important effect. And this is the fact that uh, even during the height of the Cold War, when uh, there were uh, 
major ideological differences uh, among uh, the West, so to say, and the East. Scientists, eminent scientists, had some, something in, in common. And what was in common was the fact that uh, the science was the same. In a communist environment or in a capitalist environment, the science is uh, the same. And uh, this provided a, a certain kind of commonality or a bond among uh, scientists, including scientists who were involved in decision-making in their countries, that they were playing a role in society, and that they were uh, on opposing fronts, uh, ideologically, politically, and so on. But nevertheless, they had uh, the commonality of science. And this has been playing an important role in making the influence, the impact of uh, Pagwash over the years, especially, of course, in the period of the Cold War. But it may, in some cases, happen again even now in very uh, tense and difficult, different situations or in situations in which there are ideological uh, differences, maybe religious uh, differences. Still, scientists have something in common, which is uh, the science. I used to say that uh, at the time when there was a, a very great uh, enmity between uh, Turkey and Greece. No Turkish scientist would have denied the Pythagoras theorem because it was associated with the Greek uh, scientist. The Pythagoras theorem was uh, you know, as true and uh, as a great achievement uh, for the Turkish scientist as for the Greek uh, scientist. And one can also give um, a less trivial example. Okay, so I think the time is such that we have to stop here because what comes next is a performance and then the stage I think is needed for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our speakers.